Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. This show is for anyone interested in cultured meat and future food technology. On today's episode, we're excited to have Dr. James Ryle. Dr. James Ryle was awarded his PhD in the field of skeletal muscle physiology in 2006 at the University of Melbourne. In 2008, he was awarded a prestigious research fellowship and from 2008 to 2013, he worked at the NIH on a project studying the basic biology of skeletal muscle stem cells and the process of muscle regeneration. In 2013, Dr. James Ryle returned to Australia and the University of Melbourne, where he was a leading scientist within the Center for Muscle Research, or the CMR. Most recently, Dr. Ryle joined VOW in November of 2019 as their chief scientific officer and has spent the last seven months building a scientific program around cultured meat and achieving VOW's goal of creating a cell library for multiple different species. Let's jump in. James, I'd like to welcome you to the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. James, tell us a little bit about your background and actually what led you to discover cultured meat. Sure. So I did my PhD on muscle wasting and weakness in the elderly. And I was really focused on trying to understand ways to make muscles bigger and stronger. So for the last 20 years or so, I've been really focused on how to grow muscle. So it may come as no surprise that I've been having discussions about growing muscle in a dish for the better part of 15 years. Anyone who's worked in the muscle field for any length of time at some point has had that discussion over a beer about whether or not you could create meat to eat. Cool. And you are currently based in Australia. Have you been doing most of your research in Australia? Yeah. After I finished my PhD, I spent a couple of years still researching at the University of Melbourne on muscle regeneration. So the process of muscle repair after injury. And that led me to really sort of better understand the role of muscle specific stem cells in that process. And I got in touch with a group based in the US in Bethesda, Maryland at the National Institutes of Health. And I ended up going over there and spending five years working in a lab over there, trying to understand some of the basic biology around the regulation of muscle stem cells. That sort of was my first real beginnings of thinking about cultured meat more seriously. And then I came back to Australia in 2012. And since 2012, right up until towards the end of last year, I worked at the University of Melbourne in the Center for Muscle Research, where I continued a lot of my research on muscle stem cells and sort of understanding what regulates those cells to either divide or fuse together to produce the muscle fibers that we know and love. Interesting. Okay. And so when you were in the NIH, you were actually not working on anything related to muscle tissue that you would consume. Is that right? Yeah. Look, I have really only started directly working in the cultured meat field since November last year. I've certainly thought about it extensively. And all of the research and work that I've done throughout my career has direct application to cultivated meat. But I, yeah, I, I am relatively new to this field in terms of producing a meat. Cool. And I guess a good time to transition into how you got introduced over to the team over at VOW and maybe tell us also a little bit about your role. Yeah, absolutely. So I've actually held a sort of a longstanding interest in the production of cultured meat, even though it's not been a major focus for my own research program. It was always something that I was really interested in. And I had the opportunity to be contacted by someone who wanted to come and do their PhD with me and do it around cultured meat. And at the time, I had to sort of say, look, this is not the focus of our lab at the moment. So if you came over and worked with us, then absolutely. But it would need to be a project related to muscle regeneration. And it turned out that she, this was Marie Gibbons, who is well known to, I think, a lot of people working in the cultured meat arena these days. And she ended up mentioning my name on a podcast several years ago as someone who was interested in cultured meat. And that actually sort of snowballed into a lot of people getting in touch and asking whether I was indeed working on cultured meat. And I had to say, no, it's something I'm interested in, but not something I'm working <laughs> on. And then that ended up resulting in me getting invited to come and speak on a local radio show about the future of cultured meat and what the impacts might be 
on the meat and livestock industry. And I gave a couple of presentations around Melbourne, my hometown, about cultured meat. And I think that's really how Tim and George, the co-founders of Vow, came across my name. I think they probably jumped on Google and searched cultured meat and Australia and my name popped up. And so Tim and George got in touch with me just over 12 months ago and just had a whole bunch of questions. They were in the early stages of starting Vow and trying to grow their own cultured meat at that stage and just wanted some advice on what they were doing. And I was really keen to sort of progress cultured meat in Australia and help as much as I could from my role at the University of Melbourne. At that point, I had no intention of leaving what was a very nice and safe academic role that I had at the University of Melbourne. I was just keen to try and get Tim and George to a point where we could potentially collaborate and work together. And over the next couple of months, Tim and George stayed in touch and I helped them out where I could and gave them hints on which antibodies to use and how to better culture their cells. And then in one weekend chat, George said to me, look, James, what would it take to have you come and join us here at Val? And I, I said, look, uh, it's not really something that I'm all that interested in. I'm still keen to help you out. And George, that was the first time he mentioned it. And then it didn't come up again for another couple of months. And then George got back in touch and said, we'd like to fly you up to Sydney so you can come and see our labs and see what we're about and talk to us about the research that you're doing. And again, I went up to Sydney. I'm based in Melbourne. I went up to Sydney with no intention at all of joining VOW, but just to, again, tell them a little bit about the research that I was doing and think about ways that the University of Melbourne and VOW could work together. And it was sort of during that visit that I began to see that Tim and George were actually very serious. And this was right around the time that they got an article in the Wall Street Journal published about their kangaroo dumpling. And so here were these two guys who really, as far as I could tell, didn't know a huge amount about muscle and muscle stem cells. And they were getting attention in international publications about what they were doing in cultivated meat. And that was the first time I really thought, hang on, this is something really interesting. And so after that Sydney visit, Tim and George sat me down and said, look, we want to offer you a role. We want you to come and join VOW. We want you to run the science program as CSO. I sort of said, look, this sounds all very exciting, but I live interstate. And it turned out that when I was having that conversation with Tim and George, it was about three weeks after my wife and I had found out that she was pregnant, not just pregnant, but pregnant with twins. And so I was about to start a, a new family as well. And so I had to say, look, I'm flattered, but it's probably not something that I can really entertain at this point in my career. And then no more than I think six weeks later, I was sitting at the airport about to go on my honeymoon and we were sitting in the airport and we'd had a lot of back and forth with Tim and George and I had a contract sitting in front of me to join Val as the CSO and my wife and I sat, we had a beer and a, a champagne in the airport and that was where we signed. She witnessed my signature and I joined Val officially at that point. So it was on the eve of my honeymoon that I joined Val as the chief scientific officer. Wow. Just wow. And you know, it's funny because there was a lot of suspense in that story, especially near the end, even though I knew the outcome. <laughs> <laughs> and so I guess first that podcast with Murray Gibbons was that the 80,000 hours podcast. Yep. That's the one. Okay. Yeah. And that one got a ton of coverage. So you also mentioned that Tim and George had reached out to you. I remember, I think it was like 2017 that I always started talking to Tim and, and how he had this idea. So it's definitely has been something that has been brewing for quite some time. And it's no surprise that they were able to get that not only international coverage in different articles, but eventually a couple of those big stories that have come out afterwards. Yeah. And look, to be honest, even though I was familiar with the work that was going on in cultured meat, for me, the thing that sold me was Tim and George. These are two of the most driven men that you will ever meet in your life. Their excitement and their belief in what we're doing and how it is going to change the world. They are deadly serious when they talk about Val being able to feed billions of people every day in the future. They don't say that with any kind of hesitation or joke on their face. And it's that, that was what sold me on Val more than anything else. So Val has been making a pretty great impact, but 
it is known as the, I guess, kangaroo cultured meat startup, <laughs> <laughs> or and, and I guess other exotics. But maybe tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing. Is it just going to be kangaroo? Is it going to be the traditional beef, pork, and poultry as well? Tell me a little bit about that. So I think one of the things that got me really excited early on about what Val was doing in particular was this statement that George made to me early on, and that is that almost all of the meat that we eat these days comes from four domesticated species. And that's not because they're the most tasty or the best for us or the most interesting meat. It's simply because those were the easiest species to domesticate by our ancestors. And there is 99.98% of the animals that are on this planet that we don't think about as food. So one of the things that Vow is looking at doing is creating this sort of Noah's Ark of cells. So the possibility that we could, in the future, start seeing food made up of cells from a whole range of different exotic animals that previously were never considered something that we would ever use for food simply because of availability and ethical concerns. And the, the idea that we can sort of create meat in an ethically consistent manner out of animals that we'd never even think about as food is really exciting. I think that's one of the biggest differentiators of VOW. We're less interested in looking at pork and we're less interested in thinking about beef. We're not trying to recreate existing meat products, but rather we're trying to produce brand new products that you can't currently buy on shelves. Of the different benefits of kind of doing exactly what you just described, what is the most important thing to you on a personal level? That's a really interesting question because my answer has changed. My initial reason for getting involved with cultured meat was purely an intellectual reason. The challenge behind being able to produce cultured meat in a financially viable manner it strikes me as such an interesting challenge. There's so much interesting biology and so many interesting biological questions that we need to answer to be able to produce cultured meat. So the scientist in me was really drawn to this problem. And so I think more than anything, that was what got me on board, was the challenge that Tim and George were sort of laying at my feet and offering me almost, not completely, but almost free reign to follow the questions that I was interested in following. That was what drew me to this process early on. I think more recently, and especially having recently become a father, I want to make the world a better place for my kids. I know that sounds corny, but I think in a post-COVID world, I would like to think that the world that we're going to create over the next 5, 10, 15 years as a cultured meat community is going to be one that is much better and much safer than currently exists. And that's really important to me. And that's a very good answer. Wow. And so when we think about Australia, Australia is definitely known for high quality food. So I'm going to ask you about how cultured meat will be received in the Australian Asia pack market in just a second. But more importantly, I want to ask you about the startup scene. Right now, I think there's maybe one other cultured meat or cultivated meat company or company doing work in the realm of the cultured meat industry. Do you think that more cell ag companies will start popping up in Australia? I do. I think that now that Val has shown that it's possible and that it's possible to do in Australia, we are going to see more companies pop up. I think as a lot of the costs associated with producing cultured meat, as those come down, we'll begin to see more companies pop up. And I think we'll see a lot of cultured meat adjacent companies pop up as well. It's becoming much more popular to be the company that's going to produce scaffolds for cells to grow into or to produce synthetic growth factors that will support cultured meat or to produce media formulations to sell into the cultured meat market. And I think Australia is really well placed to, in terms of the research that we do in Australia, for a lot of these startups to spin out of academic institutions based here in Australia. 
Do you see major regulatory hurdles in Australia, or do you think that they'll be no different than other parts of the world? Now, that's that's a very interesting question. And my answer is, I suspect it's going to be similar to problems faced elsewhere around the world. I do think that weight of numbers means that cultured meat is going to be approved and produced around the world, but I think it's going to take time. And how do you see Australia and the rest of Asia receive or perhaps has received cell cultured meat technology? Is it overall favorable? So I think this is really interesting. I also recognize that I exist within a certain bubble where a lot of the people that I interact with and I talk with are very similar to myself. So I could say that, yes, I believe that there's a lot of interest around people wanting to give this a go and people wanting to try this. But that's sort of within my own bubble. Whether the same is true for the other 23 million Australians, I'm not sure. I suspect that there will be a strong appetite for novel products. And that, I think, again, is where Val has the big advantage in terms of what we're trying to do, because we're not simply trying to replicate what's on the shelves. I think if, as a consumer, you go into the supermarket and you see there's an eye fillet steak that's come directly from a cow, and then there's an eye fillet steak or similar that has come from a cultured meat company, and there's a tenfold price differential there. You may try the cultured meat steak once just as something a little bit interesting, but as you're eating that cultured meat steak, you're going to be thinking to yourself, does this have the same texture? Does this have the same taste? How does this differ from what I know and love? Because I've paid a tenfold premium for this and I'm not sure that it tastes as good as the original. But if I offer you a zebra steak or a tiger steak, you're unlikely to be thinking to yourself, does this taste as good as the other zebra steak that I've tried before? This is now something that's completely new and foreign to your palate, which is kind of exciting because it's not something you're going to compare directly to in a one-to-one sort of comparison. So I think the public, the Australian public, and certainly the Asia Pacific region as a whole is going to be open to some of these sort of more interesting and exotic and boutique food experiences. And I'm really excited for us to be able to share a lot of those sort of first species with people around the world. So maybe this is an interesting time to talk about the kind of meat that you can buy today in an Australian grocery store compared to the US, for example. Can you tell us about what might be unique to perhaps an American traveler? Oh, look, I think if you walked into Coles in Australia, you would find all exactly the same meats as you would find in the US. You'd find a lot less buffalo, but you would find a lot more kangaroo. You would also find emu sausages. You may even find wallaby sausages and kangaroo steaks. So those would probably be the biggest differentiators between the US and Australia, kangaroo, emu, and wallaby. And in fact, there are several restaurants in Australia that do a national coat of arms dish, which I guess would be kind of like Americans serving up a bald-headed eagle on a plate. We don't really have apparently the same level of respect for our coat of arms because we dish up a kangaroo steak, a little bit of emu sausage, and then some wattle flowers on the side, which is Australia's national coat of arms. Wow. Okay. Well, that def- <laughs> that, de- <laughs> that definitely seems exotic. <laughs> so what are some of the outcomes that you'd like to see in the cultured meat industry? Look, first and foremost, I want consumers to have access to products. The cultured meat community has been working on this for a really long time. We're beginning to see now some scale up from different companies with the sort of alternative protein or the interest in alternative protein products. I think now is the time in the next 12, 18, 24 months to start seeing some of these products appearing on shelves. I'm really excited to see what those first generation products look like and what those first generation products taste like. So if you ask me, what do I want to see immediately? That's what I want to see. I want to see products on shelves. I guess also from a selfish perspective, I really want to see consumers excited about the new choices that cultivated meat is going to provide. And I'm really interested to see what the primary consumer of cultured or cultivated meat, who that primary consumer is going to be. It's very exciting to hear 12 to 24 months for potential 
release dates as an estimate. Can you shed some light on price parity and overall efficiency of creating cultured meat? Are we going to reach price parity? Is it going to be because the meat prices will skyrocket? Is it something that we can really get the price down? What are your thoughts on just this whole concept? So price parity, it's not necessarily really an interesting question. It's obviously an important one, but I tend to think the first couple of products that are released are going to be released at a higher price point. Those products are likely going to be sort of boutique style products. Trying to reach price parity initially, it's probably too big an ask. And again, I'm probably only speaking for some companies here. I'm sure I know that Memphis is doing amazing things in terms of getting close to hitting price parity. So I'm excited to see what they release and when they release things. But I think a consumer, many consumers are going to be willing to pay a premium initially. That premium is only going to be able to be maintained if the product that they're eating is better and it needs to be either better or different for them to continue paying that price point. There's certainly absolutely a population of people who will purchase cultured meat at a premium because of the ethical considerations or the environmental considerations. But our our larger meat consuming base are really going to need to have a reason to pay more to eat cultivated or cultured meat. What's the best way to educate others about the science behind cultured meat? And is there really anything that we should be lifting the curtains on? Anything that maybe people might not want to hear, but is important? Yeah. So I'm sort of of two minds on this. I know internally, we've had a lot of discussions about how to present cultured meat to the world. And I'm of the view that our consumers are much smarter than we give them credit for. I think that one thing that we like to do at VOW is be really, really open and honest about what it is that we're doing. And I think that if you try and shy away from the fact that we are growing, essentially growing cells in sugar water and try and present it as we take a few little cells from over here and we put it into this big tank and out comes meat at the other end. Consumers are not going to trust you as a company and losing the trust of consumers will mean that you're dead in the water before you get started. So we need to strike the balance between being able to better talk about and better communicate the science behind what we're doing whilst also not putting off consumers as well. So I certainly don't want to give hour-long lectures about trying to understand the science behind the process of myogenesis, which is the growth of new muscle. But nor do I want to dumb it down to the point of saying cells go in here, meat comes out here. Yeah, and I had to chuckle at that last example. So we hear the example that growing cultured meat is very much like a beer brewery. What do you think about this analogy? And would you say, is it accurate? Are we really going to be growing cultured meat in such big quantities? So let me answer that question in two parts. Will we be growing cultured meat in such big quantities? Absolutely. Right. And maybe quantities is the wrong word, but in such big batches at a time. I think ultimately, yes, absolutely. I think we absolutely will be growing cells in huge vats, which are similar to the fermentation vats that we see with beer brewing. But outside of that visual, I think that's where that comparison ends. A lot of people refer to that comparison between cultured meat and beer brewing being sort of a like-for-like comparison. And I think that really undersells what's been done for the cultivated meat side of things. I think if what you were to say is that if you put all of the ingredients plus water into your beer tank, but you also added in aluminium, some labels and some cardboard, and you threw all of that into the tank, and then out the other end came fully packed cases of beer cans, that might actually get close to the difficulty of what we're trying to achieve here. Wow. Okay. And that's something to visualize for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's just, there are so many interesting processes that when it comes to producing a muscle product, a lot of times we focus on the cell division step and we talk about needing to grow up sufficient cell numbers to produce mass. And that's absolutely critical, but it's the latter stages that really give us the taste and texture of meat. So those cells which are dividing, they don't really contain any of the typical proteins that we're used to in a meat product. So it's those latter stages of when those cells begin to fuse together and elongate and become these large muscle fibers. That's what gives us the taste and texture of meat. And so focusing too much 
just on the cell division really undersells the importance of the next steps in that process. We have a question from one of our listeners. Mark from New Jersey is asking, are there major concerns about bacteria or contamination when it comes to cultured meat? Absolutely. And that's a really important concern. As we begin to move up to a production phase, sterility and constant testing is something that is going to have to form a major part of the pipeline of producing this. In the same way that any company producing food has to worry about bacterial contamination. What are some things that we can expect from VAW in the coming months? Oh, lots of things. I'd say one of the most immediate and most important things is that we are about to embark on a large hiring process and that we are looking for the best and brightest to join us here at VAW. We are doing some crazy things when it comes to looking at different species and trying to produce cultured meat which is just an, it's an incredibly difficult proposition, but we're excited about it and we're excited to bring on a lot more people onto our team in the near future. From my perspective, one of the things that I'm most excited about is in the near term, we plan to increase the number of species that we have in our library. We're going to increase not just the number of species, but increasing the number of cell types that we have in our library from each of those different species as well. And that's something I'm really super excited about. Maybe emu sausage is not going to be as exotic as some of those other things. <laughs> oh, Alex, emu sausage will be a daily thing that you can eat whenever you want. Let's think more exotic than that. There's so many more interesting things that we can think about here and let your imagination run wild. You can learn more about James on LinkedIn and Vow at www.vowfood.com. James, do you have any last insights for our listeners today? I just encourage anyone who is interested in cultivated meat or cultured meat, if you want to get involved, then do so. Volunteer, go and do an online course, go back and do an undergraduate around cell division or cell biology, because this is some of the most amazing work that's going on in the world right now. I get to wake up every day, I sort of experience equal parts of excitement and terror for what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is incredibly difficult, but the outcomes of the research that my team does and that teams at all the other cultured meat companies around the world are doing will eventually change the world and change the way that we view food. And that is just awesome. I'm excited for it. James, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your insight on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. Thanks for having me, Alex. It's been great. This is your host, Alex, and we look forward to seeing you on our next episode. This program was produced by H Media. We'll see you soon.